I've determined that you're the one who did it. So I'm gonna move into the interrogation. I leave the room and let you sit there for several minutes because I want you to get anxious. I want you to think about the error of your ways. And then I walk back in. And when I walk back in, I'm gonna have a big, thick file with me. All kind of papers in it. I may have some CD disc, like Mark surveillance video. They might all be blank. But it's to show you that I have a strong investigation and I have all this evidence. So the first thing I tell you is, our investigation has proven that you're the one who committed this crime. There is no doubt about it whatsoever. We have the evidence that you did it. There is nothing that you can say that will convince me otherwise. All I want to know is why. Could you confess to a crime that you did not commit? An interrogation technique used by the majority of police officers in the United States is causing controversy across the country. Created in the 60s by the private company John Reed, this method has gone on to influence most of the interrogation techniques taught in American police academies. It involves nine different stages, leading from confrontation to spoken confession to a final written confession. This technique has allegedly compelled thousands of innocent people to confess to crimes that they did not commit. Interrogation should be conducted in a non-supportive environment. We want to get the person onto our territory, away from his or her own surroundings. The interrogation room should be quiet, private, free of any outside distractions or noises. So please, tell us what happened. Can you remember that? To be honest, I don't know. They tell these interrogators that you can tell whether someone is guilty by looking at them and listening to what they say. That confirms their belief that the suspect is guilty, and it is a recipe for disaster. When I finally realized what had happened in that interrogation room, it was like an oh my god moment. We begin to move closer, shortening the distance between the suspect and ourselves, moving into their personal space. Did something like that happen? I need a yes or no to that, okay? It doesn't sound very good. The United States can't be proud of the many failures in the criminal justice system. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody could see coming that false confessions would be that prevalent in this population of wrongful conviction. Accusing yourself of committing a crime seems unbelievable, but recently, an official study from the U.S. Department of Justice has revealed that almost a third of exonerated people have confessed to a crime that they did not actually commit. At the beginning of the interrogation, the investigator enters the room stands about three or four feet away from the suspect, looking down on the suspect, and in a very direct and unequivocal way, accuses him or her of committing the crime. That's what happens when you're dealing with crooked cops, crooked people who don't care about other people's lives. They took an oath to help to save lives and fight for people. And they did not do that, not in my son's case. They were comfortable, they were satisfied that they had a man. And that's all they really wanted was a body. So they took my son. For 21 years and 12 days, So, well, I was 23, um, forging my way, uh, what direction I wanted to go in life and everything. My job was um, kind of slowing down in the wintertime. It's more of a seasonal type of thing. Um, so I looked to uh, supplement my income a little bit. 
and I made a bad, some bad decisions in doing so. Got uh, affiliated with uh, narcotics a little bit. Some people might say a drug dealer. And um, that's where I was at at that time, just trying to figure things out. At age 43, Lamar Monson has spent 21 years of his life behind bars. In 1996, he is convicted of murder and sentenced to 50 years in prison. At the time, he's making a living by selling drugs in an apartment building in Detroit. Lamar is accused of killing Christina Brown, one of his young clients, on the night of the 19th of January, 1996. However, on the night of the murder, Lamar was far from the scene of the crime. He was at home with his six-year-old daughter. I even remember waking up, watching cartoons with my daughter that Saturday morning. You know, okay. she woke me up that morning. That was like mom. You were watching cartoons on yeah. TV? Yeah, that morning with my daughter, that Saturday morning. And um, that's like one of my fondest memories, you know, because that was the last day I was out. That Saturday morning, Lamar Monson is the first to arrive at the scene. He finds the apartment in a state of chaos, and then he sees the young Christina Brown lying motionless on the floor. On January 20th, uh, 1996, Lamar went for his afternoon shift to the apartment, and he found uh, the body of Christina Brown. He knew her as Crystal. Uh, he thought she was 17 years old. It was a, young, a tall young woman who described herself as 17. Actually, she was 12, and she was another one of the dealers who dealt out of that apartment. And what he found was this horrific, bloody crime scene. She was in a um, state of uh, needed uh, medical attention. It was just a uh, horrific uh, view, but she was alive. Um, she was waving her arms at me and trying to say my name. And I was telling her to uh, just to, uh, hold on. I'm going to get you help. Um, it ain't going to be long. And um, frantically, I'm running, banging on all the doors in the apartment on that floor, asking them to call the police or call the EMS. The police came, and Lamar spoke to the police. Uh, and the police immediately decided that he was their suspect. Uh, and so on that day, very day, he was arrested. In fact, we have a, a, a police report where the detective basically says on the same day of the killing, we can close this case if we can just get, Lam get uh, Lamar Monson to confess. I got a phone call telling me that my son had been arrested for killing a young lady. I know that could never, never, never be possible from the training that he had had from the time he was born up until 22 years when they took him away from me. I was devastated. I was sick. I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep. I walked the floor wondering what had happened, why it happened, and why would they choose him? Christina Brown dies a few hours later in hospital. The officers of the Detroit police force take Lamar Monson to the station and begin to question him. Questions like, uh, she was my girlfriend, and she wasn't my girlfriend. She was more like the little sister of the bunch, you know. Um, me living there, I never lived there. Didn't know one lived there. Um, just stuff like um, the questioning was going from a, a witness to a suspect. Part of the interview process is you're supposed to use what Reed calls the behavioral analysis interview. 
And in that, if you use these techniques, it's like, you know, you're watching a person's body language or you're watching the way that they say something or the way that they answer your questions. There's also a series of 17 questions that Reed teaches that you can ask the person. And, you know, based, Reed says that based on your answers, on their answers, and based on your observations, you will be able to tell whether or not they're being deceptive or whether or not they're guilty with over 80% accuracy. That's like a, a very fast judgment. A very, it's like being a human lie detector test. And the problem with that is read, read itself, the read people admit that it's not based on any science whatsoever, just based on their own observations. The real science is it's baloney. It doesn't work. Um, and it, when they've done experiments with it, they pretty much show that the accuracy is like flipping a coin. It's 50-50. The Reed interrogation technique makes its debut in the 60s. It is revolutionary for police stations. John Reed, a police officer from Chicago, proposes a new and less brutal approach to interrogation. I think John Reed was a reformer in many ways. You have to understand that when Reed came to prominence, um, the method that was used widely throughout the United States was what's called the third degree. Police officers were beating suspects into confessing to crimes that they did or didn't commit. They were tuning them up. They were using the rubber hose. They were grilling them for hour after hour after hour. And Reed, to his credit, knew that that was a way that was fraught with danger in that it might get false or unreliable confessions. The problem is, is that he and Reed and associates today have never come to grips with the fact that psychological interrogation tactics can also produce false confessions. The first problem is they have this analysis by which they tell their trainees that you can tell when someone's lying by the tone in their voice or by uh, their, their posture, whether they sit rigid in their chair or relaxed, whether they look at you and give you eye contact or look away or look down, whether they fold their arms, fold their legs, look up, look left, look right, you name it, it's a cue. And the retrade interrogator has a whole list of body language behaviors and verbal behaviors. If a suspect says, I don't know, that's considered deceptive. If a suspect says, um, I swear to God, I had nothing to do with this, appeals to religiosity are considered deceptive behavior. They lead their trainees to believe that they are lie detectors, that they are human lie detectors. And once you make that judgment, don't turn back, move on to interrogation. When I first entered into the homicide division, you had uh, a lot of officers, that's what they were saying, you did it, you killed her, you, you know, it was bombarding me with that. And as I'm in the interrogation room, um, like I said, my mind was just uh, all over the place, uh, just devastated by what I've seen, what was going on, and then to get here, and now you're trying to suggest that I committed the crime. Lamar Monson's interrogation continues through the night. As the hours go by, the questions progressively turn into accusations. I sold drugs, she sold drugs for you. Uh, you killed her, she was your girlfriend. And uh, just uh, creating a scenario um, that they wanted, uh, despite what I was um, attempting to um, relate to them, as far as what I know. So. Uh, we go back and forth and back and forth, and that interrogation lasted maybe uh, four or five hours because of that. Time is an important issue. 
you seldom will find a false confession taken in an hour. Seldom will you find it in two hours. When you look at false confession cases, 12, 15, 16, 18, 20 hours, people get broken down. At some point, the average person does what an average rational person does. They conclude that I need to get out of this situation. I'm desperate, I, I hate it here, I'm uncomfortable, uh, I'm stressed, and the more I deny it, the more they call me a liar, and I just can't get out this way. So they're looking for a way out of a bad situation. I'm tired, I'm worn, I'm uh, confused, and um, that's finally over with, so I'm taken to the ninth floor lockup at the time. And um, so I'm up there, just uh, woke, can't sleep, can't rest, uh, can't believe what's going on. And um, uh, you just can imagine, I'm just, uh, my mind is just scrambled. The process of interrogation is designed to put people in just that frame of mind. Make them uncomfortable, make them want to get out, and don't take no for an answer. Don't accept their denials. Now, during most interrogations, the suspect is not going to just sit there and listen to you while you develop your theme. They're going to try to deny any involvement whatsoever. But that should be expected. Many guilty people introduce their denials with permission phrases such as, can I say one thing? Would you just listen to me? But sir, if I could only explain. When the interrogator hears those phrases, it's important to interject yourself and stop the person from continuing, because if you let him talk, he'll say the words, I didn't do it. And the more often a person says they didn't do it, the more difficult it becomes for us to get a confession. If you look at any interrogation out there, what you'll see is threat, promise, threat, promise, threat, lie, 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 and it's back to back. It's over and over and over and over. And it's cutting the person off. And like I said, it's narrowing your options and giving you this perception that, oh my God, I am facing, this guy knows, thinks that I'm guilty. He has all this evidence. I know that it's bogus. These witnesses didn't see me, but they're lying on me. And he's telling me that the only way that I can get a break from this is by telling him what he wants to hear. They're so stressed. It may have to do with how long they've been there. Uh, it may have to do with the fact that it's late at night. They've been accused. They've been called a liar. They've been threatened. Promises have been made. Whatever it is, they get to a breaking point where they decide that it's in their best interest to confess. That at this moment, it's in my better interest to confess than to continue denial. Lamar Monson sees that he is about to be caught in a trap. Police detective Joan Ogoyan places a file on the table. I was brought to her office and uh, she sat there, she had a pile of files on her desk, and she mentioned, well, you know, this is, she was making reference to that, those files being evidence. Against you? Against me. And I'm like, okay, uh, I don't know <laughs> what that is, but I haven't done anything, and I don't know why I'm down here, and um, I want to go home. Basically, what was, inside this fight. Probably anything. Lamar Monson tries to ignore her, but American police officers have the right to lie to a suspect. Lying is a normal part of the process used to put suspects under pressure. I can lie to you about the evidence. Can, I can tell, can I can, lie? absolutely. The courts allow me to lie up to a point, you know, there are certain lies that are so outrageous that they're not, the courts are going to let it. But I can tell you all kind of lies. I can tell you that we have three or four, we have four witnesses who say that they saw you take the money. And you're going, my God. 
Oftentimes, they will come in with a, a thick file folder filled with papers. Doesn't matter what's in that file folder. It could be takeout menus from a restaurant, okay? And oftentimes, they will be clipped on the top of that file folder, uh, a DVD, okay? And police officers will tell the suspect that there was a camera across the street that was filming the area where the crime occurred and that their image is on the DVD. So there's technological evidence that police officers sometimes use. Other times they'll claim that they've had, they found fingerprints or blood evidence or DNA evidence. Imagine a suspect in an interrogation and they're there for, again, some period of time that is uncomfortable and the police now are lying about the evidence. That suspect may know full well that he didn't do anything wrong, but he's starting to feel trapped and overwhelmed by this presentation of incriminating evidence, thinking, I didn't do this, but they're claiming they've got evidence, and whether this is a setup or what, I've got to find a better way out. Anybody who's been the victim of a high-pressure sales tactic knows what this feels like. Anybody who says that they were never ever confessed to a crime that they didn't do, uh, they haven't been under this sort of pressure. These tactics are relentless. For Lamar Monson, time seems to stand still. The police detective offers him what appears to be a way out. Now she was saying that she believed that I didn't do it and that she was willing to help me, but I had to help her help me. So she began to give me a, a scenario of self-defense that she suggested would probably help my situation. And that um, she said if I would uh, cooperate, sign a statement, that I would be home by that time the next day. Over a series of other techniques, what the interrogator does is he narrows down for the suspect um, two choices, two paths. Both of them involve the suspect admitting their guilt, but one paints the suspect as an evil person, a monster, a cold-blooded, remorseless killer, and the other one provides an excuse for the suspect for why they committed the crime. Maybe it was self-defense. Maybe um, it was an impulsive act, not a deliberate act, not a premeditated act. And over time, you know, with increasing pressure on the suspect, um, many suspects will accept the path of least resistance and accept a less heinous explanation for why they committed the crime. During the theme, we offer to the suspect psychological justification for the commission of the crime. We don't legally justify it, but we offer him a moral excuse that will minimize or justify, in his own mind, committing the crime. And this should be done in a monologue format. It comes to the point where I'm doing this over and over and over, and I start to see you getting dejected. And I get to the point where I think I need to come in with the final question. My job, my, the goal of the interrogation is to limit your options and to give you the, at least the temporary perception that your only option is to confess to this crime. That's the best route for you to take. People don't process the words. When we have a conversation, we don't process literally what is said. We process between the lines. We process not what is said, but what is implied. When an interrogator says, I think you're a good person. I don't think you meant to do this. I think it was an accident. And by the way, I would have done the same thing. You're thinking, oh, this is no big deal. I can confess and that's my easy way out of here. And that's the point at which people confess. I was just out of it at that point. You know, I was just ready to, whatever you want me to do, you need me to sign, I'm signing it so that 
in my mind, once I got me an attorney, that he would be able to do what's necessary to show that I was innocent and that I didn't commit this crime because I didn't commit the crime. On the 30th of January, 1996, at 6.02 a.m., after 10 hours of interrogation, Detective Agoyan obtains a single signature from Lamar Monson. In this document, he explains that he involuntarily stabbed Christina Brown. Detective Gagoyan was subsequently removed from the homicide unit and later terminated from the Detroit police. And the reason she was removed from the homicide unit was because she was accused of fabricating confessions. In other words, tricking people into signing false confessions. At the time, a local television reporter from Detroit is following the case closely. Bill Proctor is well aware of the methods used by local police to close certain cases as quickly as possible. They did this all the time. They had people make statements, whether in writing or they did the writing, they had somebody sign with the suggestion that here, sign this and you can go home. I've heard that dozens of times. Dozens. Dozens of times. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if the real number doesn't run into the hundreds or thousands. Because the same cadre of bad detectives, there probably were two dozen of them, were in place for over 35 years. Lamar Monson, the charge of murder in the first degree premeditated. With no evidence or witness statements against him, on the 7th of March, 1997, Lamar Monson is sentenced to 50 years of criminal imprisonment for the murder of Christina Brown. Only one element was used against him, the confession that he signed. I didn't believe that this was going to be uh, my future, that I was not going to be in prison all my life. That's something that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, just uh, being processed for you to go into a cell. Um, the whole process of it is just um, uncomfortable. Um, you feel like your freedom is being siphoned away from you. I'll tell you one thing about Lamar. Like he said, that last time he saw his daughter, they were looking at cartoons. But everything he told me to do for her, in the letters and in his calls, I did everything he said do for her. She never had to want for anything because her father was not around. And she was a little upset and angry, her mother too, was because Lamar wasn't here to help her train his daughter, Shanika. But he had the best interest in the world for his child, but he just wasn't here to do it. So I did it. And like I said, she didn't want for nothing but missing her father. Twenty years later, a single event changes the course of Lamar Monson's life. Just around the time that Bill Proctor, the journalist who followed his case, is getting ready to retire, he receives a call from an unexpected witness who claims to know the real identity of Christina Brown's murderer. Two months before I retired, after 33 years from Channel 7, she called me on the phone. It was one of the more shocking calls I'd ever taken. As an investigator, you get many, but this woman said to me on the phone, even if you don't remember that murder that you covered back then on Boston, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. And I said, okay, I'm listening. And she explained that she was with the person who did the murder, that the person in prison was not the killer, that he wasn't there, but she was with the man who did the killing and came back from the event dripping in blood 
and confessed to her that he had killed the bitch. I've been carried this all my life for 20 years, 20 plus years I've been carried this. And for me to finally say something to somebody hearing me, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell it all. I'm not gonna hold nothing back. At the time of the events, Shalena Bentley resides in the building where the crime takes place. She shares her life with a certain Mr. Robert Lewis. Both of them were regular crack users. On the day of the crime, Shalena claims to have seen Lewis return from Christina Brown's apartment covered in blood. I'm laying there looking at TV. All of a sudden, my door opened, and I look up. He's standing in my doorway, and blood was dripping off his fingers. He had blood drippers on his boots on his jacket. Uh, looked like he had, he had so much blood on, it looked like it was blood on his nails. He think he just killed that bitch. It was very important to me that, you know, wrong is wrong, right is right. Whatever else that he was charged with and stuff, I feel like the 18 years that he did, that covered that. And that was too much. I'm the one that told him that the girl was not stabbed. She was beat to death. They, they had on there that he stabbed her. No, he did not stab her. He beat her. Shalena Bentley's witness statement changes everything. A team of lawyers and students from the University of Michigan decide to reopen Lamar Monson's case. They are part of a national network of dozens of American universities who fight against judicial errors. Over the course of a year, they retrace the police investigation step by step, trying to prove Lamar Monson's innocence. The big problem right away with this confession was that it didn't match the crime scene. So at the time, that they interrogated Lamar and then extracted this false confession, uh, got him to sign this false confession. The police believed that Christina Brown had been stabbed to death. They believe that because near her body in the bathroom sink, there was a bloody knife and she had been stabbed. So they extracted a confession or wrote out a confession for Lamar in which he says he stabs her to death. The problem was is that she wasn't stabbed to death, but the police didn't know that at the time. So a few days later, when the autopsy report comes out, it, it reveals that she had superficial stab wounds, but actually she'd been bludgeoned to death with a heavy object. It does not take the lawyers long to find the heavy object that allegedly killed the victim. On the photos in the case file, they notice that the toilet tank lid is not in the right place. And the likely murder instrument was the ceramic toilet tank lid, the heavy ceramic toilet tank lid that had blood all over it that was found in the bedroom, not too far from Christina Brown's prints. After this, the lawyers are convinced that Lamar Monson did not kill Christina Brown. As such, he could not have written the confession himself. The team from the University of Michigan then asked the judge in charge of the case for access to the objects that were present at the scene of the crime 20 years earlier. And in September 2016, two students and I went to the, to the prosecutor's office where the, the toilet tank lid was brought there and it was unwrapped. And it was still covered in blood. And amazingly, not only was it covered in blood, but there were bloody fingerprints all over it. And nobody had ever bothered to test. And so this, this student you know, was saying, Dave, look, <laughs> there's a bloody fingerprint right there. And I, so I, I whipped out my iPhone and I took photos of some of the bloody fingerprints on my iPhone and uh, then brought them back and blew them up. And we could see that they weren't Lamar Monson's. We had comparison samples of Lamar, and they looked a lot like Robert Lewis's fingerprints. Michigan State Police have new technology, and they found nine, and all of them belong to Robert Lewis, and none of them belong to Lamar Monson. I was ecstatic. 
because I know the power of forensic testimony and proofs versus what someone might say, because one is irrefutable. The other can always be cut down by a, a nasty prosecutor. He couldn't do anything with this. You should have seen the prosecutors struggle to answer the forensics that came from no less than the Michigan State Police Crime Lab. It was powerful stuff, and it was a day for celebration. Lamar Monson waves to his mother on his way into court. It's the hearing he's been waiting for, the one to determine if he will be granted a new trial. Monson Thanks to this new evidence, Lamar Monson is granted a new trial in January 2017. After a one-day hearing, the court decides to exonerate Lamar Monson. surreal for me because these things I've been praying and asking God about and to see things developing before my eyes, witness come forth after 12 years, evidence being displayed. I'm feeling vindicated in my spirit, you know, and I'm feeling good that um, I know the truth, but now everybody knows the truth, you know. So that was a, a blessing, you know, people that stood by me, um, I felt good for them because now people know that they stood by me and, and they were right to do so. Please. Lamar Munson is out on bond and heads right over to his family and supporters at the Wayne County Jail. I fast and I prayed and I cried. And I asked God, please let me live to see Lamar come home. And when February 1st came, 2017, and I was there, and he was released, I hollered and cried. I hollered and I cried. My son is free at last. I just knew it was a call to answer prayer. It's something being, we've been waiting on, something we've been anticipating for the longest, and it finally came, and uh, like I said, I can only give the glory to God. How does it feel? Your mom always says she was been waiting for a hug. To get that, to hug your mom right now, talk about that emotion. Oh, uh, it's, it, it, I ain't got words to express it, man. This woman been in my corner all my life. This is the love of my life, and I'm just glad that she finally got something happy to be, be happy about. Oh, it's a wonderful feeling. I've had now uh, 22 of these cases altogether, 17 since we started the clinic, and I had five before. And it's, it never gets old. Um, it's, it's so wonderful when the person actually comes out of the door and they're met by their family and friends and us, the, the students who work on the case, the attorneys who work on the case. Lamar Monson's name is cleared for good. Robert Lewis, the man whose fingerprints were found at the scene, has to this day still not been indicted. You have his ex-girlfriend saying he did it, and then all the people in the world whose fingerprints could be on that toilet tank lid, in blood, it's him. That's pretty good evidence. I mean, that's, that's a case where I think the, the dumbest prosecutor in the world would, could, could win a conviction pretty easily. Um, but th they've made it clear they're not going to charge him, because charging him would be admitting that they got it wrong with Lamar Monson. Christina Brown has been dead now for 22 years, but she still deserves justice. And her family still deserves justice. And they won't get it, um, because the prosecution is stubborn. He's still free walking around, and they know that he's guilty. So what does that tell you about the system? The system don't care about me, about my son. I'm a taxpayer. I've lived in this city, in this world, over 50 years. They don't care. All they want to do is get away and hurt people not try to keep families together, but separate them. It doesn't matter how.
the country is in trouble. We live with certain notions of justice, of what the law says and what we all believe in our hearts, that the person really responsible for something as heinous as the murder of a 12-year-old girl should answer for that crime. Yet, over and over and over again, I have been party to evaluating cases where there are innocence claims, and the person responsible is known and named, and the very police department that made the mistake does nothing to go back and capture and charge the person who is really responsible. Because it's difficult, because it takes extra work, because it takes new witnesses, because it takes a harder examination of what really happened, and that examination would show that the initial group of police investigators not only failed, but walked away from certain facts. They didn't finish. Can you put a price on 20 years spent behind bars for a crime you did not commit? This man received a figure and a subsequent compensation of $20 million. Juan Rivera has just received $20 million. $20 million for 20 years of imprisonment for a crime he did not commit. Juan Rivera was also forced to sign a confession. In 1997, he confessed to the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl. Attorneys decided to sue, decided to, you know, settle. I, would ask, I was asked by the news media, you know, is the $20 million enough? And I'll tell you as I tell them, you know what, you can keep the $20 million. Give me my 20 years back. I've missed my siblings' upbringing. I miss my nieces and nephews. Uh, my mother was ill at the time. My father was ill. I lost my grandparents. You know, there's a lot of things that I miss that is family-oriented, that I can never get back, no matter how much money I get. You know, they could have offered me $100 million. It would have gave me comfort, yes. It has given me comfort, but that doesn't give me my years back. It doesn't give me the years that I've lost, the memories that I've lost. I mean, to this day, if you ask my parents for any of my childhood photos, she would say she has none because the court has them. Remember, three trials. Every time we go to trial with new attorneys, they want new photos, you know, to show your human side. I don't have no records of my upbringing because they took it. My life started January 6th of 2012. That's when my life started. That's when I have record of who I am. Surrounded by family members and cameras, Juan Rivera walked out of Stateville Correctional Center a free man. All I want to do is enjoy my time with my family, man. It's been 20 years of separation, and this is a new beginning for me. I saw this for every one of us. He announced the state will not appeal last month's appellate court ruling to overturn the conviction. That and an emergency order gave the green light. So, $20 million is not enough. It never will be enough, nor any amount. Because, again, it's the memories that mean a lot, not the money. Juan Rivera is barely 19 years old when his life turns into a nightmare. On the 17th of August, 1992, the Chicago police force accuses him of the rape and murder of Holly Staker, an 11-year-old babysitter who was stabbed 27 times. The case makes headlines across the country. In the space of a few hours, the Chicago police turns Juan into a publicly hated monster. I had a different circumstance because, yes, I was an innocent person going to prison to serve a naturalized sentence for something I didn't do. So that was just added bonus to my hell. Going into prison, first of all, I'm going to an environment that is unnatural to me unknown and very, very scary. Second, I'm going in there for murder. 
third, rapey. And then fourth, 11-year-old child. So as they said, I got three strikes against me. In prison, they don't like rapists. What did they do? I got stabbed twice while I was in prison. Uh, two attempt rapes on me. Of course, I had to fight them off. Thank God that I did fight them off. Uh, it's in prison records, but this is what I had to endure while I was in prison. Juan Rivera was not far from being sent to the electric chair. These years of violence in prison, these years spent on the margins of society, have forever destroyed his trust in others and in the system. For me to hear at that time that they were willing to kill a 19-year-old kid that didn't understand what the hell was going on shows me the character of mankind. You know, I mean, to this day, I still have difficulties in trusting. Because if you was willing to kill me then, what makes me think that you are not willing to kill me now? I mean, I get death threats constantly still. And still, I got to live my life by smiling and watching my back because people still want to hurt me. You still think that? I know that because they do it to me constantly while I'm walking in the streets and I get individuals that just approach me saying, you know what, if I have a chance to kill you, I would because you don't deserve to be alive out here free when I still think you killed that child. Seriously? So this is what I got to live with, but still yet, I got to smile. In 2015, the results of DNA analyses allowed Juan to be exonerated for good. Holly Staker's real killer still roams free, and no police officer seems to be searching for him. Out of the $20 million that Juan Rivera received, $2 million were paid in by Reed following a legal agreement. In spite of this compensation, not a single police officer has been personally sanctioned. All the officers that worked in my case, as well as state's attorneys, they've all retired with pension. Full pension. There was no repercussion, no retribution, no criminal charges, mm -hmm. nothing. They actually exceeded in their job. They retired as captains, majors, lieutenants. The head state's attorney, Michael Waller, retired, and they gave him a plaque for good job. There's a culture of unaccountability, and police officers know that they can engage in misconduct that has nothing to do with solving a crime and everything to do with pointing the finger at perhaps the easiest person to point the finger at, and, and there will be no consequence. And so it happens over and over and over in the United States. Still yet, here goes a victim. Have we closed that yet? That's still open. So that means I might get clarity, I have clarity. But what about her and her family? Do they even care? No. They're not even searching for the person. They, get, they stopped already because they felt, and they still feel, that I'm guilty. In theory, our criminal justice system is designed to correctly identify perpetrators and bring them to justice. Where it fails, and where it fails because of misconduct, the reaction of the criminal justice system is really the opposite of what it should be, right? The criminal justice system tries to cover up the failure and r retain its legitimacy instead of admitting its mistakes and finding the real perpetrators. The law gives police officers what is called qualified immunity for their actions, which means it's very difficult to sue them after the fact for their roles in obtaining false confessions. And prosecutors have what's called absolute immunity. Um, so unless they become part of the police investigative process, they are not going to be held responsible for their role in wrongful convictions. Um, no one should be above the law. Um, and police officers themselves should not be above the law. Reed has not responded to any of our interview requests. However, the firm has informed us that their training procedures now take the risk of false confessions into account. 
For its part, the Supreme Court of the United States still allows police officers to lie during the interrogation stage. I remember asking a couple, a couple of these guys in depositions why they thought telling a lie was going to get the truth. And they didn't have an answer for me. They just said, well, that's what we do. That's the way interrogations go. We're allowed to lie to them. And I would again ask them, why do you think lying to someone is going to get a truthful answer and response? And they just couldn't answer it. And I, for the life of me, I don't understand why someone would think that lying to someone is going to get a truthful response back. So it's, it's a horrible practice that, that goes on all the time in, in the U.S. And it's just, it, it doesn't really serve, um, it doesn't serve justice at all. What state does the American judicial system find itself in today? With corrupt cops and untouchable magistrates, the American justice system is continuously producing more inequalities and more impunity in a country that is more divided than ever.